thanks for joining me again today. I appreciate you coming to hang out with me today. We're going to continue our discussion on mapping and interpretation of structure. Today we're going to get a little deeper into this study. Deeper being a key word. Because when I first started with Buck, uh, he was determined and he made it clear to me that if you ever really want to be a good fisherman, you want to be able to teach other people, you must really get good in this area of mapping and interpretation. It's, the, it's where we separate the good fishermen from all the rest. He said, it's, it's the most important thing. He said, now, I want you to be able to map and interpret structure and be able to pinpoint the fish from the bank down to a depth of 35 feet. He said, now, once you get good at that, he said, you'll be in a class uh, where there's only a few other people. Once you get really good at that. So, obviously, uh, he was my teacher, and I was determined that I was going to just get really good as quickly as I could. Being able to map and interpret structure and properly fish structure, both trolling and casting, from the bank to 35 feet. Now, here's where this little change is going to take place. I said I'm going to delve into something today that's a little bit deeper than what we've been talking about. And deeper being a key word. Because I did some research back around 1980 when I started noticing a change. We weren't getting the fish to move as shallow as they had been moving over the previous 10 years that I was with Buck. It was, it was normal to get a movement of fish up to 15 feet, a whole school of fish, big fish, uh, during the summer months. As long as you were in the right place, fishing the right way, you were limited out on big fish. And a lot of times those movements would come to 17 feet, 15 feet, uh, what today I consider really shallow movements. So all of a sudden, as I was teaching now, I'd been teaching in schools for about six years at that point, and the, the movements weren't coming quite as shallow. And it was noticeable. It, it was to a point where I hardly would ever get a movement of fish up to 15 feet anymore. And I was noticing that my catches, my, my good catches, were all coming somewhere between that 22-ish and 35 feet, which used to be the outside limit of where I would expect to have to go to catch a fish. So I went to the library, and I spent about three weeks, and I was doing a lot of research, and I was in conversation with Buck about it. Uh, of course, he had put in all kind of study on clouds and, and all kind of different studies on weather. And I ran into some stuff, and then I discussed it with him, that, which he said he was, he was already aware of it, and I, I was not. So, it seemed like between 1980 and 1990, this trend of deeper and deeper and deeper fish, not that they were living deeper, but they were not moving as shallow during activity periods. The weather wasn't allowing that to take place, the general weather conditions. So without going into a whole other study on weather right now, we'll do that another time, by the way. But I started thinking, in my teaching, and of course by this time, by 1990, Buck was no longer teaching. I mean, he, he really had stopped real teaching like in the early 80s. And he was leaving it up to me. Uh, well, I just started thinking on my own. I know where I'm catching my fish. And it seems to be getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. My big catches were deeper and deeper and deeper. So I started thinking, if I'm going to try to create this new generation or two of excellent, well-informed, educated structure fishermen, I better consider training them or teaching detail mapping and interpretation to a deeper depth. I then had long discussions with Buck. I asked him, basically I asked for his permission because 
I was still, I'm teaching Buck Perry structure fishing schools. And I said, I don't want to drive people away. I really don't. I don't want to make it seem like they're going to need to attend, you know, graduate school and, you know, get a doctorate degree to be able to go out and catch a bass <laughs> or a walleye. I didn't want to scare people away, but I also was recognizing that we need to teach deeper mapping. And then, of course, deeper interpretation, which goes along with it. And then deeper presentation of lures. And what I presented to him at the time was, I want to teach mapping interpretation from the bank to 60 feet, not to 35, to 60 feet. Now, because even under cold frontal conditions, and the bass is our study fish, 60 feet is about as deep as you go on. Uh, see those bass go under the under the worst conditions. However, Buck did catch a bass one time at 120 feet out in California. <laughs> but normally, about as bad as it's going to get, you'll have fish at 60 feet. And when it comes to walleye, northern pike, and muskie, I'm catching a lot of fish between 45 and 60 feet. So I wanted to teach this, but now to teach mapping and interpretation and the importance, you know, of of fishing deeper, mapping deeper, and interpreting deeper. One of the problems that comes up with this reality, one of the problems that comes up is the deeper you go in any body of water, the colder the water, the slower the fish, the more dormant they are, their metabolism slows down, and the more precise you have to be. You have to really be exact. When the fish were moving on a bar back in the early days, when I started in the 70s, they move on a bar to 15 feet, I could miss those fish by 10 feet and they come racing over and smack that lure every time. I didn't have to be that exact. I could be exact in my mapping, but in my presentation, I could be sloppy and limit out in no time. However, when you get down trying to catch a school of fish that are active, but haven't migrated very shallow, they're active at 45 feet, you have to be exact at 45 feet. So a couple of problems come up. We know the fish is dead slow down there, but it's also harder to be exact in your presentation the deeper you go. So once I got Buck's approval, I started working on, okay, what do I have to change uh, in order to be able to teach mapping and interpretation from zero to 60 feet as opposed from zero to 35 feet? Well, guess what I found out? Don't have to change anything, <laughs> which was good. However, our mechanical process does not change. Remember we said, does it lead all the way? That's step one. Step two, let's find out on that first pass. Uh, where is that final break into deep water? And sometimes we'll just have that one break. But we said it has to be between 17, 14 and 17 feet. We said it has to be between 14 and 17 feet. I said in a recent blog, I'd much rather have be able to just sort of say it's got to be between 15 and 20. But if the truth was known, I want it deeper. However, we don't always have a lake type. We don't have a, uh, a situation near where we fish, our home lake or our home river. We don't maybe don't have all of that deep structure. So, just like I'm stuck here in Florida, I'm stuck with what I have. Now, if you're going to be stuck, Florida's not a bad place to be stuck. I can fish 12 months out of the year, and they got bass, that, you know, between 10 and 15 pounds. There's a lot of big old bass down in there. And, you know, they never stocked anything in Florida. Everything's natural reproduction. It's another reason, by the way, where I hate all of the fishing during the spawn. I wish they'd just let them do it. We'd really have a, a, a blow up of, of fish population in the state if they closed the season. Uh, but uh, Florida doesn't do that. They don't want to give up the, the revenue. Uh, I'm happy to say my state of Pennsylvania, with each species, they have it all scheduled out. When that species is spawning, that uh, season is closed. And they don't open it till the spawn is over. And that's the way to really do it. So. Shout out and kudos to my 
old home state of Pennsylvania, they do things the right way when it comes to fishing and hunting. Uh, at any rate, we have to end up fishing what we've got. We've got to take what we've got. But if you live in some of the areas where so many of my fishermen are living, Minnesota, uh, Michigan, upstate New York, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, a lot of the reservoirs uh, all over the country. You've got deep structure. The only problem that all of these fishermen have is they're not detailed mapping and interpreting structure to the deeper depths. And in your step three of your mapping procedures, you're going to first follow the primary break line, but after that, if you have deeper break lines, if you have multiple break lines, you're going to follow each and every one of them and get the details and establish do the, do the, the fingers or, or the features, the unusual features occur in those deeper depths. Because where you find that feature that's occurring on that final break line, that's going to be your contact point. When we mapped that bar in our last blog up in Canada, we could limit out on big northern pike at that 45 foot all every time we go down there occasionally you get them up to 35 occasionally you get them up to 25 but the mass of the big fish the big catches made it 45 feet so if it's available if your structure has multiple break lines and the deeper break lines exist in your lake you're going to have to get good at making a detailed map of those structures paying special attention to your deepest features and then there will be hardly any weather condition that will shut you out. You always be able to catch some fish and if you don't, if you say I don't have that kind of deep stuff in my lake, well concentrate on the stuff that breaks the deepest into the deepest water in your lake and that's where you should be spending most of your time. I can always make this statement. Buck used to always say, if someone asks you, where's the most and the biggest fish in my lake? They're in the deepest water in the lake. Does that mean I can't catch fish over here where there's a structure and it has the deepest water in the area? No, I can catch fish there. But where's the most and the biggest? They're in the deepest water in your lake. That's where the most and the biggest fish are in residence right there so when you look at your lake if you've done a complete map and interpretation of all of your structure in your lake pick out the one that breaks the deepest to the deepest water spend a lot of time there especially under rough weather conditions that's what you're looking for but you have to be able to get that map now good news is we don't have to do anything different our procedures stay exactly the same we just can't be timid if you see it breaking at 35 into 50 feet of water, you better get a good picture of what that 35 foot is doing. Be sure to follow that around and get a good picture of your features on that 35. It's your deepest break to your deepest water. That's where you're going to be catching a bunch of fish. When nobody on the lake catching fish, you'll be out there catching fish. Another good thing about getting really good at deep water mapping and interpretation of structure. You're never going to find guys coming out running you over trying to fish where you're fishing. They have no idea what you're doing out there in 35 or 40 or 45 feet of water looking for a bass. Or looking for a walleye. They have no idea what you're doing. So you'll be, you'll have that spot all to yourself. Guaranteed. Okay, so today, with all that being said, I'm going to tell you about this saddle that I located at our summer school. First thing I want to do, and I'm going to do it before I forget, that same map that I started with years ago. This contour map shows this area where the saddle is. I want to show you on a contour map how it's depicted here. I'll show you this picture now. I had my wife shoot some pictures. Then I'm also going to show you 
uh, on Navionics. After you get a good look at that, you wouldn't really know there was anything there worthwhile. And then here's a picture from Navionics. Looks about the same as it looked on this map. Now I'm going to tell you about that structure and then I'm going to draw it for you in the end and show you what it really looks like. I want to tell you before we even give you all the details. This is by far the most productive structure I've ever fished. The most productive structure I've ever fished. I've caught literally thousands of big walleye off of this structure. The funniest part about this is where we were headquartered for our school. It was right outside the door. And it was an area that no one ever fished. Nobody. Now, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because, you know, any time where you have a neck down in a flowing river that has current, a big river. In fact, uh, the Winnipeg River, by the way, uh, flows north. One of the very few rivers that actually flows north. Most, as you know, flow north to south. This one flows the other direction. But, when you have a flowing river like that and all of a sudden you got a jillion tons of water coming down and coming close together right there at a narrowing or a neck down the the closer you get to that neck down the more the current picks up so when the water is coming through under that trestle it probably about 10 mile an hour current once i discovered that spot and then did a detailed map of it. I didn't know what my results were gonna be, but I knew that this structure had great potential. If I have a river where I know that the main species is walleye, and I know that from a seasonal standpoint, they will move sometimes 30, 40, 50 miles to spawn, sometimes even further. In the case of the Winnipeg, I knew that that area of the river that we're, that we're having some transitional fish that are moving, uh, from a seasonal standpoint. And at one spot that's only 75 yards wide, these fish have to pass through there. Well, what structure are they going to be using when they pass through there? They can just have a little break line over along the, over along the bank and just traverse on through up into Big Sand Lake, or is there structure there? Well, as it turned out, there was structure there. There was a saddle. It was what I expected to find, and it was there. Now, the first question we had to ask when I went out there, my first question was, does it lead all the way? Well, it's a saddle. A saddle, you can have a deep saddle in the middle of the river, but you only have deep water on two sides, upstream and downstream. When you go towards the shoreline this way, it leads to the shoreline. It's like a bar in a sense. It leads to both shorelines. In other words, it's 32 feet on top, but when you go east and west, it leads to the shoreline. So it leads all the way. The deepest water is downstream from the saddle. It's 32 feet on top. Downstream, we have 60 feet. Upstream, we have 60 or even 70 feet at one spot, I think. Uh, so we have deep water uh, downstream and upstream. And this saddle connects to both shorelines. So we know it leads all the way. So we've already answered our first question, at least... Leads all the way, at least to deep water. Well, where is the final break to that deep water? Well, looking at the final break, I'm not going to look up on top because on top it's 32 feet, almost from side to side, and then it comes up at the shoreline. Okay? But as I look downstream into the 60 feet, where was it breaking? Well, it broke at 37 feet. Then it broke a little bit again at 42 feet. And then it broke again at 47 feet into 60 feet of water. So my deepest break is 47 feet. So I already got my answer. I made one pass across the top of that saddle and off the bottom end. I already got my answer. It leads all the way and it breaks 47 feet. Now, I made a second pass, turned around, went upstream and made sure it was breaking upstream in the same fashion, which it was. It was breaking at 35, 35 to 37 feet. Then it broke again at 42 feet. And then it broke again at 47 feet into 60 feet of water. Now, 
The problem that I had with it on the downstream side, as I tried to follow the brake line, that current kept pushing my boat and the brake line was kind of straight across the river. That would be impossible to troll. As I went up across on the upstream side, if this was my saddle, the upstream side, the brake line sort of angled like that. So they were in fact fishable. It wasn't dead sideways. I could head into the current and follow these brake lines on the upstream side. They were angled where I could actually fish them. Ooh, I got excited about that. So it was 32 feet on top. I'm going to draw it for you. 32 feet on top. And the first brake line at 37 feet, when I followed it, here's where it took me. And I was looking for my features. Remember, that's, this is step This is step three. We're taking our primary brake line. In the case of this hump, underwater hump, saddle, which was 32 feet on top, the first brake line was at 37 feet. That's my primary. So I'm following the 37 foot on the upstream side of this saddle. And here's what I found. I put an X on the spots where I expected to catch a fish. Okay, so I followed my primary brake line. Now, what's the next thing I got to do? Remember I said if there's multiple brake lines, we have to follow those brake lines and see if it does the same uh, thing as it did at the first, at the primary. What I'm looking for is I'm running my second brake line. My secondary brake line was at 42 feet. And I was when I was running that, I was trying to establish are my features that I found at 37, are they still existing at 42 feet? And in each and every one of those cases where I'd thrown, where I'd marked an X so you could see them. I couldn't throw markers in a river. The current was too strong. So all was left was to run the drop off, which was at 47 feet. So as I ran the drop off, absolutely every feature that I found at the primary brake line still existed at the drop off. Now, I marked all of those. But as I followed each and every one of those brake lines up the river, but as I approached the bridge, it sort of started turning out like, a, like it was forming a bar. And then I turned back in and the 37 went across there. I did the same at the 42 and the 42 went under this trestle and the 47 feet bent over and it created this bar-like feature under that train trestle. So now, I had two structures in one. I had a saddle and a trestle. And these brake lines were at 37, 42, and 47 feet. So I was excited about the possibilities of that structure. And it was because I could read that structure deep. It led all the way. But it had a drop off at 47 feet to 60 feet in a walleye river. Man. I couldn't wait to fish it. And the day before the school started, we were going to catch some walleyes and keep some walleyes to have a big dinner for our very first party at the lake. We had about 65 people in our first class. And we had, Tommy and I had this idea. We had been working for about two, two and a half, three weeks up there, mapping about 25 miles of water. And we decided we'd catch some walleye and maybe catch a, a two-man limit, which at the time, the limit was 10 fish. And we thought we catch 10 fish each, we could probably feed, you know, our, our incoming group of people and have a big walleye feast. So we decided we'd do that. We'd just go out and we had confidence. We, we had <laughs> mapped enough spots. We knew we'd go out and catch some fish. But we had no idea what was in store for us that day. So we thought, well, 20 walleye, we could probably we get some decent fish. We could probably feed 65 or 70 people. So <laughs> the day before the school started, Tommy and I went down to the saddle. He hadn't seen it. He's been mapping Little Sand Lake, Rough Rock Lake, uh, Gun Lake, and I've been doing a lot of the river work. So uh, we went to fish our saddle. And I told him what was there. And we started fishing. And rather than give you the details of every fish we caught, 
Let me just say every spot where I showed you the features on those brake lines, including the wash and including all three brake lines underneath the railroad trestle on the, what, I, what we call the, the bar. One pass all the way up that structure, long pass, about four or 500 yards, across the bar at the trestle, making sure that our lure come up over that trestle at all of those different depths. And then we would reel in, go downstream and make another pass up starting at the 37, then we go to the 42, then we go to the 47. And then depending on what we found uh, from there, we'd fish those three brake lines. I knew exactly, now it's four hours of fishing, I did my mapping, so I knew exactly the spots I wanted to hit with those trolled lures. And there was going to be some, a little bit of play involved and anticipating when to turn the boat and where the lure was in conjunction with where the boat was because there was such a current. Even though we could angle into it on most of those runs, it was still, you had to play with it a little bit. And every time we get our lure just right into position at any one of those spots that I just have marked with an X, we catch a fish. It was like you couldn't draw it up any better. And at the end of those four hours, we had, I think we had 18 walleye. Maybe, maybe 20. But we knew we had enough for dinner. I'm going to show you a picture of that stringer that we kept. And that was just the beginning. Those fish were like that in that spot for 15, 18 years. They were always there, each and every year. There were two years where we were a little bit late, where the fish had gone through there a little bit earlier, the big mass of fish. But for the most part, thousands and thousands of big walleye came off that spot, and I'm sure continuing off that spot right now. And keep in mind, it was our process, our mechanical process, that gave me the details of that particular structure. So now we've been through a bar, we've been through a hop, now we've done a saddle. Our process has always been the same. And we get the same answer. So before I leave today, I want to make sure I want to throw it up again. Here's the picture of the map of that area. Can you pinpoint where all those fish were? No. You could Not from the map, you couldn't. You couldn't put your finger in the water right there on the map and say, there's my fish. No. And here's an avionics picture of that area. Keep in mind, they have it marked, I think, in meters there. So, uh, could you pinpoint the fish from Navionics? No. Not even close. But when you do a detail map, you follow your procedures and do a, get a detail map, then you can look at that map and mark an X, just like I did on every one of those spots where you expect to catch a fish. And I've caught schools of fish on every one of those Xs at one time or another under the bridge, all three brake lines, depending on the weather and how, how active the fish were. Limits of fish on exact spots that we could only identify from our detail map. And I'm gonna show you that last picture of the detail map. Then I'm gonna show you that stringer shot again and say, there's the difference. That's what we're after. Now, you know, I'm not against keeping a few fish for dinner. Today, I still do that on occasion. I like fresh fish. Uh, but most everything I catch today, I'm throwing back. But back in the day, we kept some stringers for, for publicity purposes, of course, and to get our message across that what we were saying wasn't just lip service. We could prove it. Our proof was in the live well. So this should tell you, if you want to catch 20 fish like that and release every one of them, good for you. Do it. But... Catching them is the fun. And what makes catching them possible is our deep water mapping and interpretation of structure. No two ways about it. So till the next time, follow us on Instagram if you would, like us on Facebook, and be sure to subscribe to our channel here on YouTube if you haven't already done it. Thanks for being with me today, and I will see you the next time.